I've been using the Galaxy S9 and S9 Plus for a couple weeks now, so I wanted to share with you my five favorite features for the phones, as well as five ways that they still need improvement. Let's start with the pros. I said it last year and I'll say it again, the overall design of Samsung's newest flagships is fantastic. Even though they haven't changed much since the Galaxy S8, they didn't really need to. The curved edges in glass front and back make them comfortable to hold, while also making it easier to reach both the top and bottom of their tall displays. The buttons on the sides are tactile and satisfying to press, it still has a headphone jack, and the fingerprint sensor has been moved beneath the camera. Not too many people enjoyed having it off to one side. Job well done, Samsung. The only problem that I could see with the overall build is that since it's all glass, it is much more vulnerable to both damage and fingerprints. You could get a big case to protect it, or you can pick up a skin from dbrand which won't add any bulk. It gives the slippery beast a bit more grip, and with a wide selection of skins to choose from, you can really make your phone stand out from the crowd. I'll drop a link down below if you're interested. The second best feature is the display. This is basically the same screen we saw on the Note 8, but with the size and shape from last year's Galaxy S8. The only differences compared to last year's models are smaller bezels and a 15% increase in brightness under direct light. Apart from that, they're both still Super AMOLED, Quad HD, and have a 185 by 9 aspect ratio. Just like before, the S9 screen is 5.8 inches from corner to corner, and the S9 Plus is 6.2 inches. Colors are extremely accurate, viewing angles are excellent, the blacks are truly dark, and the improvements in brightness is noticeable. Once again, Samsung's newest flagship has the best display on the market. Just make sure to change the resolution to 1440p in the display settings, as by default it's 1080p. When you think of a Samsung flagship, you don't always consider the performance as a pro, especially in the long run. But this year, the S9 is showing a lot of promise thanks to the new Snapdragon 845 chipset. From the first time I booted it up, I noticed a jump in speed when comparing it to last year's Galaxy S8. Navigating through the interface is fast, both application loading and resume time is snappy, and animations and transitions are buttery smooth. If you like to game, this is the way to go as well. It's packed with the Adreno 630 GPU, the most powerful graphics chipset Qualcomm has ever produced. And that's not even mentioning Qualcomm Snapdragon X20 LTE modem for improved networking performance. The phone isn't perfect though. I did encounter a few hiccups. For example, when loading up the Bixby panel, or trying to use the face widgets within the always-on display, but in the end, the pros outweigh the cons. This is definitely the fastest Samsung phone I have ever used. Still, it won't outperform some of the fastest phones on the market, such as the OnePlus 5T or Pixel 2, but it does manage to do certain tasks faster, such as loading up apps or web pages. Generally speaking, Samsung has always done a great job with the rear camera, and this year, it's the single biggest upgrade on the Galaxy S9 and S9 Plus. When compared to the S8, pictures are more detailed, but not as overly sharpened. They appear less processed, resulting in a more natural look. But the key improvement I had my eye on was the low light performance. And that's thanks to the extremely wide f1.5 adjustable aperture. When grabbing shots in the dark, photos on the Galaxy S9 have less grain and more detail since that big aperture lets more light into the camera. In fact, even in settings where I thought it would be too dark for good photos, the results were consistently surprising, providing me with pictures that looked astonishing. Now, I wouldn't name this camera the best of the year. It isn't without its disadvantages, including including a very long shutter time in low light, resulting in some blur from moving objects, and frequent overexposure in daytime shots. It comes down to this. The rear camera on the S9 is great, but just don't expect it to wow you quite like the Google Pixel did. Lastly, the best thing that I love about this phone, and this also goes for last year's S8 and Note 8, are the extra goodies that it comes with, which makes it the complete package. With every new Samsung flagship, you're already expecting top of the line specs, but you also get all the little extra features that most other flagships don't have. It has MST for contactless payments at more terminal types, IP68 water resistance, stereo speakers and a headphone jack for the ultimate video or music experience, expandable storage, USB Type-C with fast charging, and even wireless charging. There are also multiple biometric unlocking methods, Bluetooth 5.0 features like separate app sound, which plays my Spotify media on just my Bluetooth speaker while everything else is piped through my phone. Smart Select to capture certain areas of my screen, secure folder to make any file or app private. You get the point. I'd even say the main reason why most people pick up a Samsung flagship is because of all these little extra things that it can do that most other phones can't. Sometimes Samsung does overdo it though, by including superfluous, annoying, or gimmicky features. And that's where I move on to the cons of these two phones. Just keep in mind that some of these complaints could be seen as a bit nitpicky. They are undesirable features, but nothing that would ruin the phone in my opinion. Let's start with the software. 
there are a few things that Samsung still can't get right, and it has a habit of introducing new features that most people won't use. I just like to label it all under the category of Samsung bloatware. For some reason, Samsung feels the need to duplicate practically every app or feature that its competition makes, and then try to force their users to use it. So if you're in Google's ecosystem, you're most likely going to install and use Google's apps, rather than stick with Samsung's. But since Samsung won't allow you to disable some of their apps by default, you'll be stuck with the second useless calendar, clock, gallery, browser, and email icon within your app drawer. Bixby is also another great example of a Samsung feature that no one asked for. Samsung wants you to use it so badly, in fact, that it's willing to dedicate an entire hardware button to Bixby which you can't remap by default. Now don't get me wrong, some people might actually find these Bixby services useful. I'm just letting you know that Samsung is still loading its software with clones of features from Google or other third-party apps, and the competition still does a better job. This year's big new gimmicky duplication is AR Emoji, which is just a clone of the iPhone Access and Emoji feature, but 10 times worse. All the characters and stickers are just weird and creepy. Like if I sent one of these mass stickers to a girl I liked to try and make her laugh, she would probably stop talking to me. It also doesn't use any special technology like Apple does to capture your face movements. It just relies on your front or rear camera, so the tracking is jerky and bad. In the end, I don't mind if Samsung tries to create some tools that could potentially be useful, but I don't like the idea of forcing us to use them by making them difficult to avoid or disable, and I don't like the low effort cloning of its competitors' hot new features. The next worst thing about the Galaxy S9 and S9 Plus is likely to be something Samsung has been struggling with for years, and that is consistent software updates. Every year I make the same type of video entitled 5 Best and 5 Worst Things for Samsung's newest flagship ever since the Galaxy S7, and each year I still find software updates to be an issue. The Galaxy S7 took over 6 months to get the Android 7.0 Nougat update in the US, and some still haven't received it. The Galaxy S8, which shipped with Android 7.0 and not 7.1, has only just recently started to receive the Android 8.0 Oreo update, a version of Android that has been out for over 7 months now. Since the S9 is shipping with Android 8.0 and not 8.1, I'm already expecting it to not get Android P until after the next release of the Galaxy S phone. I could be wrong, the company could turn things around, but this has always been the case with Samsung devices. Ever since the commotion of the Galaxy Note 7's battery explosion, Samsung has been taking it safe. It stopped pushing the limits on battery capacity on its newest Galaxy S and Note devices. Every Samsung flagship except the active branded devices released since then hasn't pushed past the Note 7's 3500 milliamp hour capacity. This year is no different as the S9 and S9 Plus have the same battery capacity as last year's models, 3000 for the S9 and 3500 for the S9 Plus. You may think that's more than enough, but after considering how many pixels it's packing paired with the most powerful GPU and CPU on the smartphone market, as well as all those extra bells and whistles it comes with, you may start to wonder if 3500 milliamp hours is actually enough. I don't think it is. Even though I am a heavy user with Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, screen brightness set near to max, and the always on display enabled at all times, I am only getting around three to four hours of screen on time. Sometimes it won't even last an entire day if I start to use my social apps in a consistent way. And if you're a gamer, then expect to carry around a charger. It definitely won't last until bedtime. The battery life isn't terrible. There's a lot worse out there, but it's not that great either. Eventually, Samsung will have to bump up the battery capacity in its flagships if it wants to keep upgrading other aspects of the hardware. This next worst thing might be a bit nitpicky, but I do believe that most people feel the same way. Physically, the S9 feels more like a refresh of the S8 than a full-fledged upgrade. In other words, if I saw both phones side by side, at a glance, I wouldn't be able to tell them apart unless I looked at the placement of the fingerprint sensor on the back. It's not a huge deal, especially considering the last year's model was one of the best smartphones of 2017, but I don't believe that there's enough hardware upgrades, new useful software features, or design changes to call this the Galaxy S9. It feels more like a Galaxy S8 2018 version. Finally, I wanted to talk about the price. Right now, the S9 is retailing for $720 here in the US, with the S9 Plus going for $840, which is $120 extra. This is a matter of opinion, but I think many may find the cost of the S9 to be a bit high, especially considering it's pretty much a Galaxy S8 refresh. After all, last year's model will provide you with a similar experience and a much lower price tag, but some might consider it a fair price point given it's the top of the line specs. I would say it depends on what type of smartphone you're carrying right now. If you are rocking an S8 or Note 8, you'll most likely think this phone isn't worth it. But if you're looking at making your next smartphone purchase in the near future, and you're coming from a two to three year old device, 
then it doesn't get much better than this, especially if you're considering a carrier subsidy. So that's it for this video. Let me know in the comments which features you enjoy or hate in the Galaxy S9. Make sure to give it a huge thumbs up if you enjoyed. Don't forget to take a look at all those skins from Dbrand. Get subscribed for even more awesome Android content, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.